Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and we're going to be talking about, well, the monster that you guys voted for. Thank you very much for everyone participating. I think we had over 500 different comments on different creatures and the list is just, it, it, it was expansive. Every creature you could possibly imagine, plus a few that I had to go and look up just to make sure that I knew what on earth you were talking about. Anyway, the list has come back, and so in future, I'm, I'm looking at my list off, off screen here, I should have actually had it with me, but anyway, in future, we will be looking at liches. Well, actually, liches are what we're going to be looking at today. We'll be looking at werewolves, mind flares, fae, drow, uh, elder gods, beholders, skeletons and the undead, kobolds, goblins, giants, devils and demons, and shapeshifters. Those are the ones that came up the most. There were many, many, many others that came up, but didn't get as many suggestions or mentions as some of the others. The ones that stood up, well, stood out hands down, was it was a contest between liches and werewolves, and liches won out by a few votes. So we will look at all of these monsters in due course, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, something that I also thought about whilst putting together today's video was if any of you are budding artists out there, why not send through your concept for the next monster that we're going to look at so that gives you a week. We're looking at were creatures, were wolves, were boars, were bears, were tigers, were rats, were ravens, were wares, who knows, were wombats. I think that was one of them that I saw the other day. Anyway, we're going to be looking at all the were creatures. So if you are a budding artist out there, do a sketch, do a drawing of a werewolf or a werebear or a were-tiger or whatever type of were you might like. Send it along to geekstable at gmail.com and we'll bring it up and give you a screen credit for your artistry. And if we get lots of entries, well, we'll choose one of them and maybe we'll make a video of all of the ones that were submitted to show off the wonderful talent that our community has. I thought it might maybe liven up the image a little bit. So today we are talking about liches or leeches, as some people chose to write them down, unless people actually wanted a video on leeches, which uh, was not entirely beyond the realm of possibility. So, liches. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're playing Pathfinder, whether you're playing Dungeons & Dragons, whether you are playing a fantasy campaign of your own, or a science fiction campaign for that matter, the quintessential thing about liches is that they have a phylactery. They have that homestone, that device which has been imbued with their essence that allows them to achieve a state of semi-immortality. Now, that really is the, the main key. The rest, of course, is that they're undead, they're incredibly powerful, they're incredibly evil, usually, and that the choice of becoming a lich was their own, and that it was a long journey. Some systems make it more difficult, some make it easier. Some require the lich to have made a pact with a powerful god or a demon, and so have been granted the ability to become a lich. Others have a template for it, so that you can become a lich once you've got tired of running around trying to save the world. Well, now uh, you can just take over the world and install your own form of government. Liches by nature are these long-lived or unlived beings of incredible magical power that have got an even more incredible history of being a great mage or magician or sorcerer or enchanter or wizard or whatever you want to call them. They were that before they became a lich. And they purposefully chose to become a lich. So knowing me and this channel, that's where we're going to be looking at, is we're going to look at how did that journey, how did that story of this being come into play? And then how is that going to move our story forward, moving forward? Because the lich on paper is just an incredibly powerful being and has magical abilities. And if the players do not destroy the phylactery, the lich will return. That's pretty much standard law for all liches all over the place. How do we make ours unique? Well, again, we turn to its story and we turn to how did it become a lich and what was that journey? 
So liches, for me, take a little bit more of a prep when introduced into your campaign because you need to have this information if you want your lich to feel more than just the big bad at the end of the dungeon. So when we look at the journey of this mage, let's construct one as we go. We've got this mage, let's call her Davios. Davios the mage. She starts off life as being particularly vindictive. Generally, it's accepted that liches are angry people who decide that they want to live forever because they want power of some kind. Well, let's we'll explore that option too. So we have this um, Demios. I think I completely forgot her name. Demios. I'm going to write it down because otherwise I will forget. So Demios. Demios is a mage. She grew up in a city where she was used for her power, perhaps. She was entrapped by a greater mage who taught her how to uh, cast magic, but used her and abused her, perhaps, until one day she was powerful enough to escape and then head off on her own. So she headed off on her own and she needed to gather minions, she needed to get power, she needed financing and funding. So perhaps she sold herself as a magical, magi well, as a cell sword magician and worked her way around dungeons and things, amassing a significant fortune. She then invested that into significant amounts of research and in trying to expand her domain. Now, of course, as fate would have it, and, well, as the games require it almost, a group of adventurers came along because there was this despotic wizard who was stuck in a tower and she lauded her power over all that were in her domain. And she demanded magical items or spells from them because she was obsessed with gathering them. Well, you don't even need to have all of that negative story. She just has a large repository of spells and the players are going to go after her. So she has this battle with the adventurers and she triumphs because ultimately she becomes a lich. She gains more power, she gains more finances, she gains more influence until one day it strikes her that she's getting old. Now, if she's a human lich, this is around the time she's maybe 60, 65, 70 or so. If she's an elf, it's when she's four or five hundred years old, maybe even 600, 700 years old. So depending on the species, at a certain point in time, these power and money hungry people got to the point where they realized that they were not yet done with whatever it was that they're doing on the planet. They needed more time. They've decided that the priests can't help them with things like rejuvenation and resurrection. That doesn't prolong your life's natural existence. When it's your time, it's your time. So reincarnation, those kind of spells, they wanted to have control over what they were going to be when they came back. Now, instead of seeking out a vampire to transform them into a vampire so that they would be bound by blood, perhaps these sun-seeking wizards decided that it would be better to become undead. That way you could still enjoy sundowners whilst watching the sun go down uh, and operate during the night and during the day without any issue. They then start to research how to become a lich. Now, of course, this is ancient evil magic that's locked away and provided to only the greatest of scholars, or at least those who have contact with the demons and devils that live below in the uh, nine hells plains and that sort of thing. They make this deal with, let's say, a demon prince. Give me immortality in exchange for my life, so I am an undead creature, but give me immortality and the ability to remember my past so that I can continue my quest for more knowledge. The demon gains their physical life, gains a powerful ally to do their bidding on the prime material plane, for example, and so bestows the ability for this person to become a lich, described in some books as taking a potion of evil with an elixir of undeath and uh, all sorts of weird and wonderful things. However it works in your campaign is entirely up to you. The net result is that this person then rises from the dead as an undead lich with the same power they had before, only now they don't have to sleep, eat, drink or breathe, and they can operate 24 hours a day. Most rule books say that liches don't need to sleep. So they now go about getting more power. 
but they have all of eternity to do it. There's one snag, they have a phylactery, which of course, if it gets broken, they die. They also generally have to feed this phylactery with souls. Not very often, but just enough to keep the phylactery going and for the local population to be aware that someone is picking off people and they're not coming back. That's the typical journey that a lich will go on. Do you see how many points of story we can add into that? At any point, we can convolute it, complicate it. We could make it the king is abusing his, his advisor's daughter. And that's why she becomes bitter and angry. We could have it that the queen wanted to be the most beautiful in the land and so exiled her young advisor or her own daughter who was becoming a sorceress or son, gender is irrelevant. So there are so many ways that we can make these liches have an interesting story and then bring that story to life. So just having a lich at the end of your dungeon or at the top of the tower being lich-like and just basically being nasty, you can have this entire tale, this sad journey, which is told in the remnants of portraits that are found in some of the outlying rooms of the lich's castle, in ball gowns or in suits of armor, in letters that are left in a desk for the players to discover. You can literally map out this journey and let the players go on it. Imagine if your players are about to fight a lich and what the lich does is it throws open a time portal and sends the players back in time so they can see this lich's journey or they go back in time to try and change the lich before it becomes a lich, before that one traumatic moment shifts and the young wizard becomes evil and turns his heart to necromancy. So by looking at that journey, that progression, by writing it down in simple steps, you can create this incredibly, incredibly interesting lich. Then, when you look at the phylactery, the phylactery can be something special from that story. Now, last week's video was on what do villains want, and the books all categorically state liches want power power of knowledge, the power over their surroundings. Well, I would too. If I had the only ability to stay alive was to randomly feed people to my phylactery, and I didn't want adventurers coming along, but I wanted to gather books and materials together. I've been a magic user for a long time. Having a lot of books together is a very dangerous thing. There are many, many entities who would want to come and get that. But now extrapolate further. You now have this lich which has a lot of power, a lot of knowledge, is known to whichever entity that was involved in creating them in the first place, and has a position that they are fairly secure in, assuming that they've been a lich for a while. Other entities are going to turn to that lich for help. When we looked at vampires, vampires had their own covens and their own spaces when they were fairly isolationist. It says nothing about liches being isolationist or trying to hide away. Liches have got incredible amounts of power. They don't need to worry. So liches could be entertaining other evil entities. They could be pushing them forward. They've been around for a long time. Unlike dragons who are extremely powerful, extremely long-lived, but very, very mortal, the liches' only concern is that their phylactery gets destroyed. Now, yes, they have to feed the phylactery from time to time, which prevents them from just simply encasing the phylactery in concrete and dropping it into the middle of a lake. They do have to feed the phylactery. That's a wonderful Achilles heel that's been built into the uh, monster descriptor so that we can prevent those exact things from happening. So that creates a lot of plot hooks and things that you can then use to get players in. But that's their, that's their only, only weakness. So once they have that phylactery nice and secured, nice and locked down, then they become these agents to do as they please. If they want to take over a kingdom, well, that's fantastic. That will grant them tremendous amounts of power. If they simply want to achieve something else, maybe it's acclimation of knowledge, well, that's fine too. They can start harassing magicians or start a magician's college where they encourage individuals to come and study magic so that they can then steal that research. The Lich is an interesting character because of that long-lived 
process because of that journey that they've been on they've got real world knowledge they've been part of the community they've been part of adventuring groups assumedly and they've been part of organizations now they're stepping out of them so when you look at the lich it's about looking at a much much i don't want to say loftier goal but it's about looking at a character who really doesn't care about a great many things if the Lich starts an army and the army sweeps out to go and destroy everybody except for the people that are loyal to the Lich, that's a fantastic place for the Lich to be in. They have tremendous magical power. They can just create illusions of magic, of money. They can just charm those people that are going to work for them, or however they want to do it. So they certainly have the time and the resources to make an army happen or to make a laboratory happen, or to fund a college. Now, that could be quite a fun story. Imagine if Dumbledore was actually just a lich, and he was using all of the little wizards to find out spells that would help him live longer, and, well, whenever one of them disappeared, he had a nice little excuse in the form of Voldemort must have taken them. Meanwhile, those poor kids are being locked away in a phylactery somewhere. Was it really the Philosopher's Stone, or was it just Dumbledore's phylactery? Well, there's an interesting theory. Well, that's completely wrong, of course, but that's the, that's the sort of the idea. The Lich could start a college. Interesting adventure that the players suddenly discover that the uh, patron is actually undead and evil and using the college for their own gains, but at the same time training up mages. So is it really that evil? Well, yes, it is, of course, because the mage are, mages are being sacrificed to the Lich's phylactery from time to time. Something else to bear in mind with the Lich as a monster is with all of this history, with all of this wonderful, wonderful richness that you can pull on, something else is that you could also have villains who are currently active in the campaign realize that they can't defeat the players. So perhaps they get the players to help them become a Lich or they become a Lich as a result of the players. I can't defeat them whilst I'm alive. So if I'm dead, then maybe I can be. Again, it's just another wonderful, wonderful story plot hook that you can add in to have your players follow and see where they go. So some examples of liches. In one of the games that I ran for my players set in the world of Braxia, there was a lich that was created and, as a matter of fact, caused a catastrophic event. A mage who was the head of the mages guild in one of the great cities on the continent was conducting experiments in becoming a necromancer and becoming a lich. He was already a necromancer. The players discovered this ruse and started to try and thwart him. What ended up happening was a gigantic showdown in the middle of the magical library where fire was unfortunately the choice of weapon used to try and defeat this ultimate evil. The lich being unfortunately, was not stopped in time, and so became a lich as the library started to burn down. The library, of course, was filled with magic books. This angered the lich immensely because they wanted to gain knowledge, but the magic books started to explode with random magical effects as well. The books are full of magic, so why not? I thought, let's throw in a little bit of a Terry Pratchettian library-like event. The Lich escaped. The players managed to escape. The entire city was burned to the ground and everyone just blamed the a poor little candle was set too close to a curtain. Much, much later in the campaign, several months later, as a matter of fact, they start to hear rumours that there is this change of ownership at a massive castle, Grathen Keep, which straddles a mountain range and is the home of the Kingdom of Brunei's most trusted and valued knights and warriors. They heard rumours of change happening, did nothing about it, didn't want to investigate it. And so months later, they eventually went to Grathen Keep to discover that the Lich had taken up residence. But the Lich was no fool. He had heard rumours of this powerful group of adventurers going around thwarting all sorts of uh, powerful individuals. And so when the players arrived at the castle, this Lich proposed a deal to them. He was not content with simply taking over all of Braxia. That was his original intention. He decided that that was too small a thought process. He wanted to take over all of the planes as well. However, because Braxia is plane locked by the backstory of the dragons being locked away in a dimension uh, with a, all sorts of magical anchors in place, the Lich couldn't move between dimensions or planes. The player's characters, however, could, and the Lich knew this. 
So the lich offered a deal. He would leave the prime material plane for all time if they provided him with the ability to move between planes. His, of course, intention was to take over each plane that he arrived at and so become planar lord of all and then return to Braxia much, much later once everyone had died because, well, long lived and reclaim his prime material plane. The players decided that that was a bad idea and so refused to assist. They got into a very big battle with the Lich and nearly didn't survive, but they did and they managed to escape. They didn't kill the uh, Lich. One of their uh, members drove the ship into the tower. They have an airship. They drove the airship into the tower, knocking everyone over and everyone managed to escape. Months and months and months later, the Lich is now consolidating his power and has now launched armies to take over the Prime Material Plane. Being denied access to the planar regions, he now decided to take over the entire planet. And why not? He had all of the armor that Grath and Keep used to generate, and he had abilities to gather more coin. That wasn't a problem. So now he started to take over the entire planet. At the same time, just to give you context, there were several other wars going on, so the armies of the, the globe had been fairly thinned out. The players knew this. It ended up with the players turning to a dragon for help. And in an ironic twist of fate, the dragon destroyed the lich, the players destroyed the dragon, and then the phylactery was destroyed by the players in a last-ditch effort to save everyone. So this grand, grand conclusion came. They destroyed their airship in the process of destroying the dragon as well. Uh, that's not exactly how it played out, but that's, that's close enough for the, for the analogy. So in other words, the Lich's journey changed. And the reason why his goals and things changed was because the way the players interacted with him, but also because of his history. He had been a mage who had been advising the players for many, many, many game sessions before on planar travel, on the power of the anchors that are all over the world to keep people from moving across it. So he was there really pushing a planar agenda. He realized he couldn't do it, so he became a lich. So that's a, a lich's journey and how it can come together to guide you, to give you this long, epic storyline without it just being a monster at the end of the dungeon. Now, some good examples of liches, really, in terms of literature and that sort of thing. You've got Voldemort, obviously, from the Harry Potter series. It never expressly says that he's undead, but he certainly doesn't look like he's living. And, well, all of those um, horcruxes stored all over the place, that to me certainly seemed like a very interesting take on the lich uh, from, from J.K. Rowling. Now, the other lich that I can think of is Skeletor from He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. That skull-like face is definitely undead. He was a powerful magician, and he doesn't seem to ever age, so maybe he is a lich. What does he want? Eternal power, and he's not afraid to try and get it. So liches are a very interesting, interesting creature to add to your repertoire of monsters if only because they bring this wonderful sense of having been a real living interacting individual to now shifting to this one who is so far removed that they are definitely very very different how would dragons treat liches i think they would see them as a threat to the dragon power Dragons, of course, reign supreme, but here you have someone who can't die unless a very specific item is found and destroyed. That sounds like way too much effort for a dragon. Vampires, I would see, as fearing liches. Well, you've got this being that doesn't have to sleep during the day so they can operate twice as long as you can. They're after the same kind of idea. Liches need living beings that they can sacrifice to their phylactery. Vampires need living things that they can sacrifice to keep themselves alive. There's a lot of linkage between a vampire and a lich. I don't think they'd be allies. I think they might work together very, very, very briefly if it was to bring about the downfall of someone who's destroying the living. Now, that's an interesting little conundrum, isn't it? The undead, prince of darkness, the vampire, and the lord of death, the lich, working together to keep the living living because they both need them to stay alive so that they can stay undead. 
There's an interesting twist there somewhere, I'm sure. I'm sure you'll find it as well. Liches, more to it than just the stat blocks, I hope you see. And a great opportunity for you to give out this wonderful piece of history of your world or to help create history in your world by having your players create a lich that just brings an extra dimension, an extra flavor to the idea that evil has more to it than just knocking down the door and killing the big bad on the other side. If it has, hit that like button. If you want to see more of the Monster series, and I'm fairly certain you do, Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already joined our legions of people who think similarly or who don't. Some of the comments are often very contrary to what I've said, which is fantastic, so we can get to see different points of view too. Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming. <laughs>